Okay. So we left off talking about the what a gene looks like. So remember we have chromosomes, chromosomes, and on those chromosomes we can have a gene. Let's say that gene's for hair color. And this could be a, a brown allele, and this could be a blonde allele. And so we'll just kind of zoom in on this allele and look at it specifically as a context of, say, part of a gene. So, so, so I know the slide says it's a gene, and I kind of reverted back to that terminology, but really it's an allele. Um, and so these alleles are composed of three subsections. One part is called the promoter, and then the other part is called the coding region, and the last one is called the terminator. So the promoter's job, because there's areas in between here that are spaces in between genes, right? So this could be, say, for uh, hair color. This could be for uh, your blood type. And areas in between here are, are not, not alleles, not genes. Okay? So the promoter's job is to turn on and off the, the gene. And by turning it on and off, we, were, we mean converting that DNA into RNA. So remember, we the first step is DNA to RNA. And what do we call that? Do you guys remember? Yeah, transcription. All right. So the promoter's job is to line up an enzyme called the RNA polymerase. Because it's the, like the like the DNA polymerase that we talked about in the last chapter, whose job is to take DNA and make new DNA. This job of the RNA polymerase is to take DNA and convert that into RNA, so to do the transcription. And so the the regions of the promoter, the only thing to tell the polymerase how to bind and how to turn that on. So this is like an on-off switch, but actually more like a dimmer switch. So, how to turn it on, how fast to turn it on, or how slow to turn it on, how much RNA do we want to make, a little or a lot? And that really depends on what we're making. Does that make sense, everyone? All right. So, and then we have the coding region, which is the part that's actually going to be turned into RNA. And then the terminator is where we want it to stop. So, promoter, coding region, and terminator. The terminator itself is a physical block. It's kind of like a, you can think of this as a train and it's rolling down the tracks. And if it didn't have a stopping point, what would happen? It'd just keep going. And so the RNA that you're making would look different. So that if the RNA is the basis for the protein, then your protein would look different too. And that could be bad, right? It, you could make something that's toxic or whatever. Um, and so if you're, if you're, you guys heard of genetically modified foods, right, GMOs. So if you're, if you want to put a gene, and we talked a little bit about the glyphosate, the Roundup. Remember we wanted to increase that C gene in there. So if you wanted to insert a gene, you would want it to, to be able to make lots of product. So you'd want a specific promoter. And the federal government makes sure wants to make sure that that thing is going to stop where you says it where you say it stops because if it doesn't it would make a different protein which could be harmful does that make sense okay so the promoter itself has different regions in it and i think we talked a little bit about this so uh, in eukaryotes there's a thing called a tata -ta box and it's called that because it has these sequences t a t a and a t it can either be an a or t an a and a or t um, so uh, this gene is for beta globin you guys remember what that is it's 
so it's the beta subunit of hemoglobin that we talked about in chapter five when we looked at the different kinds of protein structure. Remember we looked at primary, secondary, tertiary, quaternary. You guys probably forgot all about it, but we did cover it, I promise, at some point. Um, and so this is a eukaryotic gene because uh, bacteria don't make blood, right? They don't make hemoglobin. Uh, this is a what we call SV40, so it's a simian virus. And so this has a different, different elements in the promoter uh, that recruit things called transcription factors. So in fact, let's say that this is the itself, and then there'll be a couple of other nucleotides there. So this Tata box actually recruits something else called a transcription factor. And it's the transcription factor that tells the RNA polymerase that it needs to come and bind to that specific region. So this has different elements found in it. So this is the GC boxes that are shown here in green. Uh, if you're a virus, would you want your genes turned on all the time or would you want them to just be not turned on or just a little bit turned on or? Right, because the goal of the virus is to get in, infect the host, make as many viruses as you can and get out as fast as you can before you're detected by its immune system, right? So this promoter is turned on all the time. So if you were going to engineer a gene that you put into, say, a corn plant to make it resistant to Roundup, what kind of promoter would you want to use? So what's a good, what's one that would be on all the time? Virus. virus. So what they use is a, a promoter called a cauliflower mosaic virus. And that's how you can tell if it's genetically modified. Because if you're not a cauliflower, you shouldn't have a cauliflower virus part in you. Does that make sense? So I used to have my biotech students look for this, doing the same technique we did in the lab with PCR. And if they, like, so they would go to Whole Foods and get a bunch of food there. You know, they say that none of their food's genetically modified, but then they, my students would find out like half of their food's genetically modified, so they would threaten them. You guys need to give us a lifetime supply of papayas or We'll rat you out, you know, that sort of stuff. And then the terminator is from a thing called INOS, which is no alpine synthase, which is from a bacteria called Agrobacterium, which is one of the ones I see most. So would you find would you find a bacteria DNA in a in a corn plant normally? No. So you would know that that's a genetically modified plant or, you know, food, if it had those things in it. So the reason I'm showing you this, is I don't want you guys to memorize all of this, but what I want you to know is that different promoters have different elements in them because they're turned on differently. So what is this one? What's a kinase do? It has a phosphate. So do you, do you need a kinases on all the time? No, not really. What about this one? What's this? Right, so a histone is what the DNA is wrapped around, right? Do you guys need histones all the time? When would you need a histone? Right, so the only time you would need to make histones is if you're making new DNA, right? So are your, all your cells dividing right now? Then those cells don't need histones. Only the cells that are actively dividing need new histones. So would you want this gene on all the time? No, just on certain times. So this, the elements in here say, okay, turn this on a little, every once in a while, and so on and so forth. Then there's other elements in here, right? There's elements that respond to Estrogen. There's elements that respond to testosterone. There's elements to, that respond to cortisol and other steroids. So 
but but each one of these elements has a corresponding transcription factor that will bind to it and tell the polymerase how much RNA it should make from the specific allele. Does that make sense? Alright. So, um, for transcription, there's three steps. Uh, initiation, elongation, and termination. So, um, here's the promoter, which is shown here in the green. Um, and then this is the RNA polymerase, this is an egg looking thing. And basically the RNA polymerase binds to the promoter, it opens up the promoter, and then it will start making the RNA transcript at the start site. So what happens is that the RNA polymerase has a specific shape, and so let's say that that letter is like so. So that's how it works, right? So it, it opens it up, it starts reading it right here, and it's going to keep reading it until it reaches the end. So initiation is opening it up. Elongation is simply just putting in the letters that match it, and you can see the RNA is coming off of this thing. And a 5 prime to 3 prime. It's always 5 to 3, right? Why is it 5 to 3? Because that 3 has that hydroxyl group on it, remember, just like DNA. And then once it's done, the, it hits the terminator, it physically falls off, the RNA polymerase falls off, and the mRNA, the completed mRNA is released, which is shown right here. So everybody see that? I'll take that as a yes. All right, so well, let's look at these clo a little closer, uh, each of these steps. So for initiation, Remember we have the promoter element, that ta-ta box that we talked about? And what is the ta-ta box job to recruit what? Do you remember? I wrote it up here, but I erased it. It's a transcription factor. So you can see that here. And the transcription factor binds to this specific sequence. Proteins can recognize DNA sequences. And so it binds. And it, there's a lots of transcription factors. You guys can see that there's at least one, two, three, four, five, six here. And all of those are required. Each one of those bind to a different one of those elements, right? So the octamer, the cat box, the GC. And all of those tell the polymerase how, where to start, because that's really critical. What if it started down here? Would it make the same protein? Thanks. It, it wouldn't. So the transcription factors tell it where to bind and how fast it should read the RNA. So should it be on a lot? Should it make a little RNA? Should it make none at all? Should it be on all the time like a virus? And, and so together, this is called the transcription initiation complex. 
So I'm just going to show you guys real quick that it's actually a little more complicated than that. So this is a, a typical uh, initiation complex right here. And so you guys can see, this. here's the, the polymerase right there, shown in, in blue. And you can see all of these other, these are the transcription factors, and you can tell they are because they start with TF, right? I don't know if you guys can see that, it's kind of small, but these are the transcription factors. This is the polymerase the, in blue. And so you can see there's all kinds of stuff that's binding to this polymerase, this RNA polymerase, to allow it to know how to specifically, how fast or slow to read that gene and turn it into RNA. So you're just getting a really small piece of it. And I'm not even making you guys know any of these. All you have to know is generally that they're called transcription factors. So once the transcription factors are bound, the polymerase binds to that, it opens the DNA. So this is just one strand of DNA I'm showing you, right? There's another one that's a five prime to three prime. So it will open the strands of DNA. And just like we just did, if it sees a C there, what's it gonna put in? A G, if it sees a G, it'll put in a C. And so that's the elongation portion. And it's, it's you know, it's pretty uneventful. It's just basically matching the letters, letter for letter, and it will, will produce this growing uh, messenger RNA. So once it hits the terminator, it falls off, and that's released. So termination is pretty uneventful, too. Any questions so far? Okay. So after the mRNA is produced, so what, uh, let's just say that this is the mRNA to produce. There's some modifications that have to occur here. And so one of the modifications is that we want to put a cap on here. So it's a G cap. And this cap serves two functions. One of the functions is that it helps protected from enzymes inside the cytoplasm because they'll chop this up and you need those enzymes because uh, you don't want to have your RNA around all the time, right? If you're cold and you make RNAs to make you shiver, when you get warm, what do you want to happen to those RNAs? You want them to be broken down. So you need those enzymes to, to chop this up. So this protects it. If it, that wasn't there, the RNA would never last very long at all. So the second thing is, is that the ribosomes, so remember the next step from RNA to protein involves, what's this called? Translation. And this involves, what does the translating? What turns the RNA into protein? Ribosomes. So the ribosomes need to know where to read this thing. So would it read the same if you read it this way as opposed to reading it from this direction? Then it will make a different protein, right? So the cat tells the ribosome that it needs to start reading at the five prime end. That's how mRNAs are always read on the five prime end. So two purposes for the five prime cat, protects it from degradation, helps the ribosome recognize where to start reading. Any question about that? So the next modification is there's an enzyme called polyadenylase, and on the three prime end, it adds A's, and this can vary in length, somewhere between 20 and 200 repeats of A's. So remember we talked about telomerase, 
right? And and so what is its job? It makes the ends of the chromosome longer, just with junk, right? Why does it do that? Right. So the ends of the chromosomes get extended because every time the DNA gets copied, they get shorter. So you put this enzyme out in this nasty cytoplasm where there's all these other things that want to chop it up, right? So which one would last longer? One that has a whole bunch of A's on it or just a few? The long one, right? So you can vary how stable your mRNA is by varying the length of the poly A tail. So it, the poly A tail helps prevent it from being degraded by enzymes in the cytoplasm. Um, it helps, again, tell the ribosome, don't start reading on this end, right? This has the A's on it. You want to start reading over here on this end because it's got the G, the 5 prime G. Um, and then another thing is, is that, remember, this is, we're talking about eukaryotes. So where's the site of transcription? Where does this occur? In the nucleus, right? Where does translation occur? In the cytoplasm. So the mRNA has to leave the nucleus and go into the cytoplasm. And without the poly A tail, it can't do that. How do we know? Scientists have cut that off and guess where it stays? In the nucleus. So we know that the poly A tail is involved in telling it it's okay to go ahead and leave the nucleus. So three three functions for the poly A tail. Any questions about that? All right. So the next thing that gets modified with the messenger RNA before it leaves the nucleus, uh, there are regions in the message. So we're going to pretend like this is our message right here. And there are certain regions in here that eventually get cut out. So there are areas called exons. And then there are also areas in here called introns. So I'm just going to number these, like if this was exon, the first exon, I'd call it one, we could call this one two, we could call this one three, and we could do the same with the introns. But I'm not going to bother the introns because what happens is, is that in eukaryotes, these introns get cut out. And then the RNA is spliced back together so that only the exons are present. of this splicing, you 
you can make more than one protein from a, a single allele by, by switching around the exons. Does that make sense to everyone? I guess we'll find out on Thursday. So that's showing you here. Here's an exon, exon, exon. The introns get cut out, so the light pink is removed, and only the exons remain. We still have the cap, and we still have the tail. There's a leader region that, remember, the mRNA has to know where to go, because there's two places it can go once it leaves the nucleus. What are they? So think about where's the mRNA need to go next. Right, it needs to go to the cytoplasm, but what's going to turn it into a protein? So there's two places that it could go. There's two different areas. What are they? There's two different kinds of ribosomes. <laughs> Not really. So there's, there's ones that are found on the rough endoplasmic reticulum. Remember those? are destined to be exported out of the cell. And then there's ones in the cytoplasm that makes things that stay in the cell. So this thing is just a bunch of letters, right? Like words in a book. So it has it's, it has its own instructions. So this that leader area right here has to tell it, which ribosome do I need to go to next? Do I need to be exported or do I need to stay in? So that ultimately doesn't isn't part of the final protein. It's just a signal to tell it where to go. Alright, so the way the splicing works is that there's things called small nuclear ribonuclear particles um, or proteins. So this is just showing you there's a specific kind of RNA and there's a special kind of protein and what they do is they bind at these These junctions between the introns and the exons, right? The goal is that it wants to fold the exons so that they are next to each other because there's a reaction that has to occur. We want to cut out the intron, right? And then put the exons together. So what's the reaction to cut the intron out? Dehydration puts stuff together. So it, it's hydrolysis, right? Hydrolysis cleaves. Hydrolysis, so these are going to move towards each other. Hydrolysis, imagine if I had a string, right? And I want to cut it out the middle part. But I only get one cut. So I couldn't cut it here and here. What I'd have to do is put it together and cut it like that, right? Does that make sense? So the spliceosome job is to fold that string, that mRNA together, and then cut it once. So that's a hydrolysis reaction. And then what's the next reaction it has to do to put it together? It would be like me tying the string. What's the other reaction that puts molecules together? You learn this in chapter five. It's the opposite of hydrolysis. Yeah, dehydration, that's right. So the dehydration reaction links the exons together. So the spliceosome's job is to perform a hydrolysis and a dehydration reaction. Then the introns cut out and the exons are linked together. Is there any questions about that? Okay. So these, these exons generally code for a certain domains of a protein. So I'll give you an example. There's a, you guys are familiar with estrogen, right? So can estrogen go through this cytoplasm without a channel or not? So it, it's a lipid, and she's right. It can pass through the cytoplasm. So if you were, your cell is exposed to estrogen, it would go into the cytoplasm. Here's the nucleus. Here's a, a gene. Let's say it's an estrogen responsive gene. And what are, what are the three parts of a gene? Promoter. So I'll say that 
that's a, a P right here. And I'll, I'm just going to zoom it out. So estrogen comes in. There's a receptor, a protein. So it's called an estrogen receptor. And that receptor has three domains, just like these three exons. Right? And each one of them has a different job. So let's say that this is exon 1, exon 2, exon 3. So one of these, its job is to bind estrogen. So we call that the estrogen binding domain. So estrogen will come in here and bind to that region of the protein. Right? That signals it to go into the nucleus. So, the, so this one is actually a DNA binding domain. Proteins have 20, 30 exons in them. Alright, so that's transcription. Do you guys have any questions about that? So translation is this part, right? RNA getting turned into a protein. So how many letters in RNA? Four. And how many letters in a protein? Twenty. So we have to turn something with four letters into something with twenty letters. And the and the question is, how do we do that? So let's say that we have, if we're looking at one letter in RNA, let's say that we're, what are the four possible letters that it could be? If we're just looking at one one single nucleotide in RNA. C, G, A, or U. So let's say we, this w was one amino acid, right? And we could make this another amino acid. So actually I'll call it amino acid number one. We could call it tyrosine. This could be amino acid number two, and we could call that Serine, this could be amino acid number three, and we could call that uh, tryptophan. And this could be amino acid number four, and we could call that methionine. So is, if we looked at one letter, is there enough variation to code for all 20 amino acids? I can only do four, right, with one letter. So I could use two letters, right? And how many combinations would I get if I looked at two letters. If this has four possible combinations, what if I add two in there? How many combinations can I get? So this one's a fourth, that one's a fourth, so a fourth times a fourth is a sixteenth. Is that enough combinations to get twenty different letters? No. So then what do I do next? I have to add three, right? So that's 
one fourth times one fourth times one fourth, which is. Is that enough? Yeah, it's more than enough. So what happens is, is that in RNA, it's read as what we call a codon, which is a three letter code that codes for a specific amino acid. So that's what's showing you here. So here's our DNA strand. Remember it's three prime to five prime because it's only reading one strand. So the RNA, what direction is RNA and DNA always read in? Five, two, three, right? It always has to add on the three. So if there's an A in this DNA on the three prime end, then there's a U on the RNA on, a, on the five prime end, right? And then because U isn't enough letters to code for a specific amino acid, we need all three. So this is the codon, ACC in the DNA. What would be, or sorry, that's the template. Here's the codon, which is UGG in the mRNA. And that codes for the amino acid tryptophan. This one's AAA in DNA, so the codon is UUU, and that codes for phenylalanine. And then we have CCG, and that codes for GGC, and that codes for glycine. So the ribosome's job is to look at the mRNA and put in the appropriate amino acids with the help of the transfer RNAs that we talked about in chapter 5. Alright, so here's the genetic code. This was discovered by scientists simply putting in messenger RNA into a cell. So like if you just put in a messenger RNA that said A, 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 it wouldn't matter how it read it. It would code for whatever A, A, A is, right? And you would get that in the protein. So what is A, A, A code on code for? Well, no, this, this is the codon, right? This is the mRNA. So what, pro, what amino acid does that code for? LYS, right? Lysine. So on the test, I'll give you guys this genetic code. So all you need to know is figure, all you have to figure out is the codons. All right, so if I gave you, if I wrote out this DNA sequence right here, this three prime to five prime, you should be able to turn that into a messenger RNA and then you should be able to tell me what amino acid is going to be made from it. Alright, so if this is CCG, what's the codon? Let me, let's just make one up. So let's say the DNA is ATG. So what's the mRNA? So that's the codon, so what is it code for? So TYR is tyrosine. Do you guys see that right here? So that's kind of an example of stuff you'll see on the exam. Yep, you'll have that code, that this whole table will be on the test, guaranteed. Yeah, I, there's no way that you can remember, memorize that. Like, I don't even know, I don't even know the genetic code, right? I figure there's a book I can open and look at it. And I've been doing this for 30 years, so. Alright, so everybody understand how the code works and how, to, how it, it gets turned into protein? All right, so the reading frame is really important. So let's make this a little longer, since we've already got this. And I'll say that this is A, A, G, C, T, C. And so let's go back and let's, let's finish playing the game. So if this one is A, T, G, this is the first codon, U, A, C. So this is the next codon, right? Well, sorry, this is the next thing that's going to code for a codon. So what's the next codon? So what is that code for? So UUC codes for phenylalanine, right? You guys see that? Right here. Um, and then, so what's
puts the next coat on from here. And so what would that mean? So that's glutamine, GLU is glutamine. So this is what our protein would look like, right? And this Remember we talked about primary structure, so it's just the amino acids order. And if you don't remember that, you should probably go back to chapter five and check it out. But this is what we're making. We're making the primary. So do you guys remember what, if that's five prime, what, how does the protein start? What's the, how do we start making the protein on the amino or carboxyl end? amino to carboxyl. And we talked about this in chapter five too. So I'm sure I know you guys forgot that, but you have you if you want to learn this stuff, you probably should go back and look at that again. So we we're talking about the reading frame because if the ribosome didn't read this correctly, let's say that it, it accidentally screwed up and instead of reading it here where the U is, it read it here. Would that make the same amino acid? What would we get if it was ACU instead? <coughs> yeah, so that's three and E. And then this would be UCG, and that would make. So that's Siri. So is this the same primary structure? No, it's completely different just by moving over one letter, right? So that's what we mean by the reading frame. You could move over another letter and that would be completely different too, right? So if you move over a third, it goes back into frame. Does that make sense to everyone? So the reading frame is really important. Mutations that cause uh, reading frame changes are really bad because they change the whole protein, all of the amino acids in it. All right, so again, translation involves three steps, just like transcription. So we have initiation, elongation, and termination. But just just to remind you, so this is the mRNA right here. And so here's a codon, it's UUU. So transfer RNAs, tRNAs that we talked about in chapter five, they have what we call anti-codons. So they match to the codon. So if the codon is UUU, what's the anti-codon? AAA, and you can see that here. And in fact, here's a codon, GGC, so what's the anti-codon on the tRNA? And you can see that right there. So everybody understand codons and anticodons. And the tRNA's job is to bring in the amino acid that's going to be linked to this growing polypeptide chain. So that's how it works. All right, so if we look at the tRNAs, this is the what we call the clover leaf structure. Uh, it can do this even though RNA is single-stranded because the bases can interact with each other. So they, it can form shapes, just like a protein, right? It can form a three-dimensional shape. Um, this is what it actually looks like. So what what end do you think that the, the uh, amino acid is linked to? The five prime end of the RNA or the three prime end? Why the three? Right, you can't you can't make water from a pea. So this is why it was important you guys learned dehydration and hydrolysis reactions. You have to add it on the three prime end because that's the only one that you can do dehydration on. So the amino acid gets linked here. So this is this is a enzyme. Remember, enzymes are, are things that do work in the, our cells. And so we have a tRNA, right? Let's say that it came in to the ribosome and it and it gave up its amino acid. So now it doesn't have an amino acid, so it's worthless, right? 
you just want to throw it away, put it in the lysosome, what would you do with it? Yeah, so you, you, you'd go and put another amino acid on it so that it could come back in. So the enzyme that does that is called amino acyl tRNA synthetase, and it's shown here in the gray. So the amino acid comes in, the tRNA, if it doesn't have an amino acid on it, it's called uncharged. So the uncharged tRNA comes in here, and then this enzyme links it together. What's the reaction that it does to link it together? No? When we want to when we want to add one molecule to another molecule, make a covalent bond, what do we do? What's the reaction? It's, it's what do we call that? Dehydration. So this enzyme's job is to do a dehydration reaction. Remember, all enzymes have a specific shape. So the tRNAs, they all have a different shape too, right? So how many different enzymes do you think there are of amino acid tRNA synthase? Is there just one? Yeah, because they have different letters, right? They have different anticodons. So how many different enzymes then? How many possible combinations do we have? Right, so there should be 64 different amino acid tRNAs in this. In reality, there's not. There's 61. And the reason is, is because how many stop codons are there? Three, and the stop codons don't code for anything. So there's 61 different amino acid tRNA synthases. So this is how it works. We talked about this briefly when we were talking about ribosomes in Chapter 6, uh, but the ribosome has two subunits, a small subunit and a large subunit, which is shown here. The large subunit has uh, three sites that the tRNAs can bind in. So it can have three tRNAs in here simultaneously next to each other. And it's showing you here that. So this is the exit site, this is the peptidal binding site, and this is the amino acyl uh, tRNA binding site. So this is where a charged tRNA comes in, one that has an amino acid attached to it, because the enzyme that does that is called amino acyl tRNA synthase. Uh, this is the peptidal site because this is where the growing peptide chain extends from. And this is called the exit site because this is where the uncharged tRNA leaves. Okay, so this is how it works. Here's the P site that has the growing chain of amino acids on it. Uh, the next codon where the tRNA matches it comes in and then this is linked onto this. So what's the reaction to link this to this one, you think? Dehydration. Dehydration, excellent. So now this one doesn't have a chain on it anymore. It's empty, it's not charged. So the whole ribosome moves over, how many letters, you think? Three. And so this one ends up in the E site, this one ends up in the P site, and then the A site has one that can come back in. You guys get it? And so that's how it's done. Uh, so there's three steps. Like I said, initiation, elongation, and termination, just like transcription. So the way that this works is in eukaryotes, it will find the cat and it scans until it hits a star codon. So I'm going to change these. So let's say that this is A, C, G. So it's going to scan until it finds the start codon. So it'll load on here and it'll keep, it'll ignore this. And where's the start codon? It shows you right here. So it's this one. 
AUG. So it, this will be the first one that gets read into the protein. So what's the first amino acid in this protein? Yeah, it's methionine. It's right here. So this would be met, and then it would read the next one. So UAG, and it would put in the appropriate amino acid. So the small subunit scans, finds the, the Stark codon, recruits the first charged uh, methionine uh, tRNA to bind there, and then the large subunit comes in. This reaction isn't doesn't involve nucleotides, right? So they can't drive it, the ribosome forward, so it requires external help. In this case, it uses not ATP, but GTP, because it's a close chemical cousin. What does A's and G's have in common? You guys remember this from chapter five? They're both purines. All right, so the enzyme that does this, and this is just, this is, it's not a circle, but this is a diagram to show you what's going on. So here's the mRNA, here's the P site with a growing chain, the A site's free, so a charged tRNA comes in, it binds there. The ribosome for, forms a reaction to link this over to this one. So now you can see the growing chain is on the A, and the P one doesn't have anything on it. Did everybody see that? So now the ribosome has to move, so we need energy. That's in GTP. It moves over how many letters, you think? Three. And so now this, the one that was in the A site ends up in the P site. Everybody see that? And the E site leaves. Where does it go? Right, it goes to get another uh, amino acid put on it, and that enzyme is called amino acyl tRNA synthase that does that. So, and then the process just keeps repeating, right? So, from the start codon until what do you think happens? It hits a stop codon, right? So, there's three stop codons. So, the stop codons are UAG, UAA, and UGA. Right, and just to remind you guys, it's on the table, so I'll, I'll tell you the stop codons, UAA, UGA, UAG. For my genetic class, I make them memorize it. Come on, there you go. So basically what happens is, there's a tRNA, right? It doesn't have an amino acid tRNA synthase, so it, it can't get charged, it can never get an amino acid on it. So when the stop codon comes up, the anticodon for that tRNA binds there, and it can't do the reaction, it can't do a dehydration reaction. So it says, okay, that's the end of it, that's the end of the show, everybody go home. And so everything comes apart. And the, the primary structure of the protein is released. So that's termination. Any questions? Okay, so an, an, an mRNA is kind of like a highway. So if, if you guys were driving up here, like I came up on the 202, it, it's not like I can get on the highway and nobody else can get on the highway until I get off, right? So it's the same thing here. Uh, a ribosome can load on an mRNA, find the start codon, and start reading it, right, in three-letter chunks. Once it's out of the way of the start codon, another one can get on it, just like another car on the highway, and it'll start reading it too. So you can end up with, like, lots of ribosomes on the same mRNA. So one mRNA equals lots and lots and lots of protein, and we call this phenomenon polyribosomes, because poly means what? many and ribosomes, you know, you know what those are. So this occurs both in prokaryotes and eukaryotes. All right, so that's not the end of it, right? So we have the primary structure, but what has to happen to the protein next? What secondary structure? 
they interact, right? Hydrogen bonds interact to form a three, start to form a three-dimensional shape. What's the tertiary structure? The R groups interact to form a shape. So it folds into a three-dimensional shape, and that's what's the most important thing in biology? Shape. So this thing, shape, is critical. It's critical that it folds the right way. Um, you know, it's like origami. If you don't fold it right, you're not going to end up with a crane at the end. You're going to end up with some, some piece of junk, a folded piece of paper. And so there are some things in here, there are some proteins called chaperones. They, they originally were called heat shock proteins because what happens to your proteins whenever you get hot? They change their shape, right? So what would you like to do so you don't die? Make sure they, yeah, keep the shape. <laughs> so chaperones, their job is to, to, to grab the hold of that protein and close it. And the reason they're called heat shock proteins is because they, there are lots of them made when organisms were in heat distress. And so we now know that they help proteins fold into their correct shape. But that's not the end, right? Other things can be happen, can happen. So in eukaryotes, you could have a protein. It has a three-dimensional shape. It goes through the ER, and you add a sugar to it. What is it called now? Protein with the sugar on it is a glycoprotein. What's a protein with the lipid attached to it? A lipoprotein. So you can modify it in all these different ways. And in fact, the difference between the blood type A and the blood type B isn't the three-dimensional structure of the protein once it leaves the ribosome. It's how it's modified in the endoplasmic reticulum. So A blood has a mannose sugar attached in a different place than B blood. And that's the only difference. Because all you need is it to have a different shape, right? And if it has a different shape, it's different. Does that make sense? So we could add sugars, we can add lipids. What if we add a phosphate to it? What happens to it? You guys know, you add one molecule to another molecule, what happens? It changes its shape, right? And if it changes its shape, it has a different function. You could also modify it by taking off amino acids on the ends, cutting it in half. You could, we talked about quaternary structure, right? You could have two or more subunits come together to make it functional. So there's all kinds of things that happen after translation. All right, in prokaryote translation, this is kind of interesting because in prokaryotes, there's no nucleus. So the site of transcription is the same as the site of translation. So let's say this is the DNA, right? And we have the RNA polymerase, and it's reading this and it's making the RNA, right, from the DNA. And so while this thing is making RNA, the messenger RNA, ribosomes can jump on there and start making the protein all at the same time. So transcription and translation happen simultaneously in prokaryotes. Can this happen in eukaryotes? No, why not? Because we have a nucleus, right? And transcription happens in the nucleus, and translation happens in the cytoplasm. So prokaryotic translation is different. Termination is also a little different, but I don't care that you know that. All right, so that's it. The whirlwind tour of chapter 17. Do you guys have any questions? All right, so I'll show you guys a few videos so that you can kind of see what's going on. Uh, the, this site is called DNA Interactive for D, uh, DNAI.org.
I'm going to go to code and then we'll look at reading the code. Actually, let's go to copying the code. So I'm going to go to putting it together and then this is transcription. factors called yeah they're, that's what they're doing they're doing transcription so that's right transcription factors So you can pretend like you're an RNA polymerase, right? And so here's the DNA, the DNA unzips, here's the polymerase, here's the RNA subunit, and so here's the template strand. So we have an A on the DNA, what goes here? Look, you guys got it right. And then if there's a C, what goes there? And you got to check. And it just keeps going until what? It hits the terminator, right? And then it, it falls off. So it's it's pretty straightforward. And then let's look at um, so we're gonna go to reading the code and then we'll look at translation here. So you can there's another video that shows you subunit of the ribosome and what comes after that? The large subunit.
What's that three letter code called on the tRNA? The anticodon, excellent. And that's matched to the three letter code on the mRNA, and what's that called? The codon, excellent. So while we're on this, uh, it also has a, like a little interactive thing, so you can pretend like you're a ribosome. So let's do that real quick. So here's the mRNA, here's the large subunit of the ribosome, there's the anticodon, there's the codon, and then the amino acids are attached to that. This one is the growing chain. So what side is this one in? The E, the P, or the A? P, right. And what this one coming in is going to be in the... And this one leaving is the... Yeah. So we'll pretend that we're a ribosome and we see the codon AUG. So what do we put in for the anticodon? So let's find it. And nice. So that's the star codon. And then the next one is UCA, right? So three letters down. And what is that? That's how it's done. So, any questions about that? All right. So, since I have this side up, I'll show you guys the um, DNA replication one too. I think I showed you this before, but. sections called? You guys remember? They're called Okasaki fragments, yeah. That's right. Alright. So, so 
that's it. We're done. We got like five or six minutes. So if you guys want to ask any questions. So uh, the final exam schedule is a little weird. So it's hard to get everyone together and me as well. But what I'll do is I'll post a, a final exam, like a one probably from spring. So a review that you guys can look at. Uh, I'll put it in the in the course media section. Okay, so that you'll have to look at it on your own. So just a reminder: your final exam is on Thursday in this room at eight thirty-five. I'll be here at eight thirty. So if you want to start early, you can. It'll be the same format: fifty questions, multiple choice. So you'll need a green scantron and a number two pencil. Uh, it'll cover just three chapters, so 14, 16, and 17. There'll be genetics questions on there, so make sure you guys do the genetics practice problems that are on Canvas. It's important that you're able to do those because you'll see something like that on the exam. Um, and then the extra credit will be the blue people one, so I told you guys that there'll be two questions about that. And then also there'll be two extra credit questions that have to do with uh, Hardy Weinberg and the other one will have to do with the chi-square. So I'll give you guys the formulas, you'll just have to be able to work out the problem. So there's 12 extra credit points available to you. Uh, I'll probably uh, do it either tonight or tomorrow. And, and you definitely will need a calculator to do Hardy-Weinberg because you guys know that you have to do square roots. So you need a calculator that does square roots if you want to get those extra credit points. So there, there'll be the extra credit. I asked you, I told you guys that the, the enzyme that causes people to be blue, what that enzyme does, there'll be one Hardy-Weinberg equation that we did in lab. You guys did that in lab too, I assume. And then there'll be one on chi-square that you did in lab. Did you guys do the chi-square in lab? So chi-square is the st statistical analysis that you would do on your plants to find out if they, if what you found was what you expected or not. Did you guys not do that in lab? All right, I'll just put two Hardy-Weinberg ones on there then. So it'll be similar to the question that I had my students do in lab. And if you guys didn't do it in lab, it's it's a question number four, I believe, about the cystic fibrosis thing. So out of that lab. So just make sure that you do a couple of those Hardy Weinberg practice problems. And there's videos on YouTube and stuff that will show you how to do it if you forgot. So other questions? Alright, if you guys didn't get your test, I have your tests up here. Um, and other than that, I'll see you a week from today for your final exam. Yeah, because the grade book's there. Put it on canvas. So they'll give you a yeah, so if you can't donate, they'll give you a note. If you can, they'll give you probably a barcode that gives you your blood tracking thing. Uh, well, I have until 5 p.m. on Friday, so I have to get it up by then. So I'm, I'll be grading all day on Friday like crazy.
Ben Taken. <laughs>